So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first panel discussion of this event to mark the launch of the uh, ECB EOPA discussion paper on the protection gap. This panel is on the private insurance sector and capital market initiatives to reduce the climate insurance protection gap. My name is Justin Ray. I am the head of the policy department at EOPA, and it is my pleasure to moderate this panel um, and, and my pleasure also to have been invited to, uh, to the launch of, um, of this important paper. I will say a very few words and then I will um, pass on to my distinguished panelists. Um, I think one of, the, one of the good things about this paper was that it requires us to think about what are the benefits as well as the challenges of the protection gap as the sort of unit of analysis, as, a, as, a, as something for consideration. I think it's one of its great benefits is that it requires us to think about insurance in society as a whole. But in a sense, that is also one of its challenges. I mean, particularly um, coming from EOPA as a prudential supervisor, um, what, the protect, what the protection gap uh, requires you to do is realize that sometimes the solutions are not are not only restricted to more prudential supervision that what may be good for an insurer such as raising premiums or withdrawing coverage may be correct from a prudential perspective but are not optimal for society I mean, Demetrius made that point and others have also um, also said the same thing I think what is also very interesting about the paper is that the this this ladder of intervention shows that the market cannot always provide effective solutions, though some solutions definitely remain commercial, and there was uh, already some discussion about uh, about cat bonds. And moreover, that the protection gap has wider repercussions, certainly beyond insurance um, for banks, as has already been described, and of course for the wider economy. That. I thought one of its best insights, it's not an original insight, but I think it is very important to, to state it, that in a situation such as the protection gap, the more that you need insurance, sometimes the harder it is to provide. Now, let me turn to my distinguished panelists. Um, I will say briefly only um, who they are rather than um, introduce them more widely because they will be introducing themselves in a moment. So we have... Um, Larissa Dragomir, who is Deputy Head of Unit at GG FISMA in the European Commission. Um, Shiguru Arizumi, who is the Vice Commissioner for International Affairs of the Japan Financial Services Agency and also Chair of the uh, Protection Gap Task Force in the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. Um, Jerome Egili, who is Group Chief Economist at Swiss Re and Belinda Storey, who is Managing Director at Climate Sigma. What I will ask the panelists to do is to uh, introduce themselves briefly, um, just saying a little bit about who you are, but also highlight the interest of you and your organization in, the, in addressing the protection gap and whether you have any high level response to the to the paper. So I will ask each panelist starting with, uh, in turn to do this, starting with Larissa, um, and then Shiguru, Jerome, and Belinda. Um, and then there's a few more questions that I will ask, and I hope if there's time, we will have some questions, um, questions from the floor. So um, please, Larissa, let me hand over to you for your introduction. The, the floor is yours. Many, many thanks, uh, Justin, and good morning or good evening <laughs> to, to the participants. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of this panel. I'm honored and I'm sorry not being in the room, actually, to meet you all in person and to interact with, with the participants. Um, Justin already um, told you that I'm working at the European Commission. I'm the deputy head of the insurance and pensions unit. And this is a unit in the inside the Commission which is in charge of managing and implementing um, EU policies that relate to the single market for insurance, 
reinsurance, occupational and personal pensions providers and insurance intermediaries. So for those who are not very familiar with the Commission, we are a bit the counterpart of the EOPA in the European Commission, and we are part of the DG FISMA that stands for Financial Stability, Financial Services and Capital Markets Union. And DG FISMA has as its mission to preserve financial stability, to protect savers, investors and policyholders, fight financial crime but also to ensure uh, the flow and access to capital for businesses and consumers in the European Union. So um, in, this, in the context of this mission, DG FISMA pursues, especially over the last years, a strategy on sustainable finance that, is, um, that has as its aim to facilitate the flow of private capital to support the transition to a climate neutral economy. And as you know, insurers and pension funds are among the main largest uh, institutional investors in Europe. So our unit is very much involved in actually delivering on the um, sustainable finance strategy. At the same time, also given the specific role of insurers as providers of risk cover and their expertise in risk management, we also cooperate very closely with several other parts of the Commission. Uh, we call them Directorates General. And in relation to climate change, actually, we have developed a very close partnership and collaboration with um, DG Clima, that's a Directorate General for Climate Action, who is leading the Commission's efforts uh, in fighting climate change. And currently, actually, we are fully involved with DG Clima in a joint project. We have launched the Climate Resilience Dialogue that explores ways to narrow the, the climate protection gap. So uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here today to assist to the launch of this event because um, the paper, the ideas in the paper, the reactions to it are very important for us to integrate them in our own analysis and build on them and um, complement reflections and information that we are um, in the process of gathering. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussions. Thank you so much, Louisa. Um, but very clear. So let me turn to Shigeru and let me ask you, well, let me thank you, of course, Shigeru, firstly for, um, for, for attending. Then let me ask you a question, which is in a sense in two parts. And one part is, what do you consider to be the supervisor's role to address the protection gap? And secondly, and particularly in light of your role in the IIS, can you tell us more about the importance of collaboration at international level to address the protection gap? Thank you, Shigeru. Over to you. Thanks very much, Justin. And I also uh, um, apologize for not being able to attend in person. It would have been a great opportunity to uh, get together with our European colleagues. I especially enjoy a very uh, good re working relationship with uh, EOPA, including the chair, Petra, and also uh, Pamela, who is the uh, vice chair for the protection gap uh, task force. So we, we have been working very constructively in the field of insurance. As you may know, the Japan FSA is, is a integrated regulator. So we not only cover insurance, but we also work on banking and securities, uh, even FATF issues actually. And I oversee mainly G7, G20, FSB, IOSCO, IAS uh, issues, and also cross-cutting issues such as uh, sustainable finance, as well as uh, digital innovation. So that's that's the kind of a portfolio I have. The challenge here on protection gap is, first of all, which protection gap you want to look into. And that, of course, you can discuss in the context of climate in general. Cyber is one of the topics, but uh, I think there was a broad consensus and strong support among IAS members to uh, to first take on the, the natural disaster uh, protection gaps uh, because it's a uh, it's it's quite clear that the frequency and severity of the uh, natural disaster has been uh, quite increasing and uh, there are also uh, uh, many uh, good cases perhaps uh, in terms of not only supervisory or regulatory implications but also in terms of uh, public and private partnerships so I think that uh, prompted the IAS to work, to begin work on this uh, and formulate, uh, as Justin mentioned, the protection gap uh, task force, which is currently working uh, to put together a report uh, on, on the uh, protection gap uh, 
issues, uh, hopefully uh, in time for the uh, annual general meeting in Tokyo uh, in November of, of this year. I also like to make some comments on in, from a uh, G7 presidency perspective, uh, because to, as you may know, uh, we are Japan is the G7 presidency, holds the G7 presidency this year. I actually had to stay over here because I had to uh, work on the finance and ministers and central bank governors communique, as well as the leaders declaration that was just issued uh, over uh, this weekend. But as you may know, in the G7 finance ministers and central bank governors uh, communicate, there's an uh, explicit mention on uh, natural uh, disaster protection gap. And I can just read it to you. And you may have uh, seen it already. Uh, it says that given the increased frequency and severity of natural disasters that are exacerbated by climate change, enhanced co coordination by the private and public sectors, especially for vulnerable countries, is critical in promoting disaster risk finance, including insurance, in order to narrow protection gaps. It also says, we also look forward to a report by the IAAS in collaboration with the OECD on how to strengthen economic and financial resilience against natural disaster risks by the end of 2023. So there's a clear uh, mention in the G7 uh, communique uh, where the ministers and the central bank governors agree that uh, they look forward uh, to further work uh, in this uh, area. Uh, just a few words on the discussion paper uh, published by uh, the ACB and the IELPA. I think it was, uh, I'm very much impressed with the comprehensive approach, not lo only looking through the financial stability lens, but more broadly, uh, including the social aspects, including fiscal, fiscal implications and so forth. So I think it's a very useful paper that uh, could be, I, I think, taken as a reference for uh, many of the advanced countries, uh, f first of all. And I also um, um, very much like the concept of the ladder approach, uh, which, which put forward a conceptual sort of a idea on who does what in terms of uh, narrowing down uh, on, on the division of labor, sort of say, between the public sector and the private sector, uh, which helps, I think, would narrow down the uh, protection gap that uh, is, is in place right now. For me, uh, in Japan, we also have a government reinsurance, which, uh, in, which was established in 1966, very old uh, uh, scheme. And uh, it also has a three-tier approach, uh, which uh, mainly looks at the private sector. Then there's a PPP aspect. And there's a, if you go up through the threshold, it's more, more public rather than private. Of course, it has a skin in the game, but so the private sector uh, contributes a small amount in, in, in the case of a very large catastrophe. But uh, I just wanted to share that with you as, as we go. So let me stop here if that's, uh, that's okay. Thank you very much, Shigo. Um, and I, I think everything that you said was important. I think that it is highly relevant that you know, this sort of language of protection gaps um, and disasters and so on is now in the in the language of the G7 in their communiques. And you're also quite right, of course, to say that um, I mean we're talking today about the protection gap, but once you start looking for these gaps, you find them all over the place. And you know, the, the kind of concept of a gap as a unit of analysis is also there in pensions and other parts of insurance and so on. So it is it it is everywhere. Um, let me turn, please, to Jerome. And maybe Jerome, if I just ask you to make an introductory statement, and then I'll come back to you. Um, shortly afterwards with a, with a question, but please, Jerome, the, uh, the floor is yours. Perfect. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, maybe a quick uh, presentation from my end in terms of uh, who I am and what do I do. I'm Group Chief Economist of uh, Swiss Re, responsible for the economic and insurance market uh, forecasting as well as the research, including uh, the Sigma research, which is uh, very well known and actually now running 50, for 55 years. I'm also a board member of the International Capital Markets Association, ICMA. I state it because I think it's important in terms of the solution, um, what's out there to reduce the climate insurance protection gap. Maybe briefly to set the stage, uh, uh, Swiss Re, obviously, um, for us, this is uh, protection gaps are at the center of, uh, of what we do. Um, we price protection gaps. We uh, try to narrow them, obviously, with reinsurance uh, solutions, and we transfer part of them uh, to capital uh, markets. Swiss Re is the largest uh, NATCAT uh, reinsurance uh, provider 
uh, globally, and uh, we also provide a lot of uh, research on Sigma, uh, be it on NATCAT front uh, with our NATCAT Sigma or then with protection gap with our resilience uh, work. Well, well, maybe 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 a few uh, introductory statements on the on the topic, and then also a quick reaction on 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 the paper since you asked for it, uh, Justin. So first of all, if 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 you look at uh, what is the state of the market, what is the state of the market? And Justin, you mentioned protection gaps; they are everywhere. No question about that. Not so much thinking about about the cyber protection gap, definitely thinking about the topic here today, the climate protection gap. Uh, fact is that about 75%, 75% of NADCAT losses globally are unprotected. And uh, if you look at health protection and the mortality uh, protection gap, the other two key um, perils, uh, they're actually much larger on the climate front, but doesn't mean uh, that we need, we don't need to do more and actually much more on the climate uh, protection gap. I, I think basically uh, today, fact is we don't only have a climate protection gap, but we have a resilience protection gap. That's why I also very much uh, welcome uh, today's paper, but also the collaboration of IOPA and the ECB to come up actually with the research uh, report. Now I mentioned 75% uh, is the NATCAT uh, protection gap uh, globally. Maybe more interesting is actually that uh, on a longer term uh, average, the annual rate of uh, insured losses on the NATCAT front continues to increase at a steady rate of five to seven percent. And five to seven percent, that's one number. Uh, but if you compare it with uh, the annual uh, GDP growth rate of two and a half percent, uh, you see the urgency. Not only is a large protection gap, but the protection gap is increasing annually at, at a quite a large uh, um, a, a large uh, rate. Uh, now, in, in terms of the climate risk, definitely, definitely I view it as a, a future uh, risk on the economic front, not just on the economic front in terms of the future losses for our society and uh, for, for, the, for the lifehood and for the society uh, overall, but also in terms of accumulation risk. And you've mentioned it before in new introduction statements, Justin, we have to think about uh, the interrelation of the risks with the banking, with, with real estate, uh, with the financial market risk. And that's why I, I see very much the risks being non-linear, meaning the more we wait in, in order to tackle them, the worse uh, the downside uh, becomes. Now, maybe more in terms of the solutions. Uh, I, I really think that uh, it, it's, it's super important and the key that we are able to price, first of all, climate risk. What is climate risk? And pricing climate risk comes with uh, being able to identify approximately, approximately, and we will always remain extremely approximately, protection gap. That's what, what uh, you're also trying to do and you have been trying to do uh, for, 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 for decades. And really happy that you come now to the same conclusion that we have been coming, uh, which is protection gaps, they matter. They matter a lot for economic uh, growth. So we need to price the climate risk and then we can also manage and, and, and transfer uh, the climate risk. And I think uh, with, with any markets, uh, it's important that uh, uh, the price of risk is not being uh, distorted. And I think actually, if you look at the, at the risk of climate, not just protection, but, but, but just the pricing of the risk, if you bear with that, with that concept, the problem here is that it's being uh, distorted, distorted. I say that for, for, for a number of reasons. Number one, if you look at the carbon pricing instrument, it's six dollars per metric on average. Uh, that's the price uh, for metric ton of CO2, um, according to the latest IMF research, six dollars uh, per metric, way too low, way too low. It needs to be at least uh, 75 dollars. And second, um, if you look at our research out there um, in terms of uh, what is needed for green finance and sustainable finance, huge investments are needed and actually this is the biggest i think opportunities also uh, ahead of us to transform the financial markets huge investments annually we forecast estimate that about 270 270 270 trillion dollars are needed by 2050 this is a cumulative number now if you look at the best data out there from icma international capital markets association fact is yes green finance and green bond market is growing uh, but it's still only about 2% of the overall uh, bond market. 
Capital markets are definitely key, insurance companies are definitely key, policy action is definitely important to price the risk and regulate uh, the risk accordingly and guide the markets. But at the end of the day, we need to unlock the potential that exists in capital markets. Now, now with this, and I don't want the abuse of time, Justin, but we also invited me and the other panel makers to make comments on the paper. Let me make five short comments. Number yeah. one, great paper. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, taxonomy. I think we need, you know, the solution for on barriers, we need to work further on taxonomies. There are too many shades of green. Um, the paper and this discussion is entitled policy options to reduce. And for that, we need less shades of green. Second, regulation. Regulation always needs to be market uh, consistent. And uh, obviously market consistent, if you don't dispute the view, and I don't think you do, that climate risk is systemic risk. And then I just wonder actually, what is the path ahead at the G7, but also at the European level in terms of the regulatory uh, envelope? It needs to be also consistent, not just in Europe, but also in a G7 context. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, fourth, the PPP model, um, definitely, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it is a, a way uh, to go and, and you include it also in your paper. I think there are more policy options. What is the viable model? And what does, uh, not sure if ECB should have a view on that and has a view on that. Uh, I, I don't sure if IOPA would have a view on that. Maybe other players in European context like the EIB or the European the Commission has a view and should have a view. And maybe they have and maybe something that can be shared. And last but not least, and then I stop. I mentioned before the capital market is key. But let me also say we need to have uh, more asset uh, classes and we need to have asset class for sustainable infrastructure debt. I don't think this is off topic at all because sustainable infrastructure uh, uh, instrument goes a long way actually uh, to um, to make us ready not just to tackle the current protection gap on the climate but, but the, the protection gap that exists very much on climate adaptation that's super important as well and that's why um, we have been calling for a long time to standardize infrastructure that sustainable infrastructure as an asset class and I think that may be something to consider in future iterations of this uh, discussion paper but thank you very much and I stop here. No thank you very much Jerome and uh, uh, very thought-provoking um, backed up with, with lots of facts and figures and let me just say a couple of words in instant response to what you said I mean your your, your your figure that insured losses are increasing by five to seven percent I mean that is that, of course, is a good um, is a good reality check. I mean, we think we've done a great job identifying the protection gap, and we now kind of use it. But of course, we're not solving it, um, and you know that that statistic kind of makes that clear. I think that one of the other issues you highlight is the need to do things in an imperfect world. So, I mean, you refer to carbon pricing and you know, it either not existing or being too low. You refer to the need to have sort of uh, an agreed taxonomy uh, well, throughout, throughout the world, ideally. Of course, these things are highly desirable, but in a sense, from a from a practical perspective, what can we do even in even in that absence? I think that then, yeah, I think the the, the paper is is part of that, um, and a model for PPP. I mean, I again, that is something which is. Um, which will will need to be developed. I mean, EOPA did some work in relation to potential models during the pandemic. Um, and yeah, among the, I think there were four principles that stated, them, and among those is one that is already, that is also in this paper, the idea of skin in the game. And the second that you can have a model, but it's not going to cover everything. I mean, it's not going to cover the whole risk. Um, and so um, yeah, you, they're, they're, it, it will address, it'll address the problem but not the not the the entirety of the problem but thank you very much here and then we'll come back to you um with some questions later um so let me turn thank you for your patience let me turn to belinda and uh, thank you for calling in from uh, from new zealand i believe so really um yeah we're, we're very grateful that you have made the time for us and again i'll ask you please to make um just to make some introductory remarks and then we'll come back to you um with with some questions in in, in a little bit so please belinda over to you uh, kia ora koutou from New Zealand, um, Aotearoa. So um, I am um, Managing Director of Climate Sigma, which is a small independent research firm. Um, as 
in that role, I um, manage a $10 million five-year uh, research program looking at extreme events in New Zealand. Um, and I am also have recently um, conducted research on insurance retreat. So this is where the insurance uh, protect, so the protection gaps becomes um, significant, specifically because of a withdrawal of supply by insurers. Um, in terms, um, uh, I've sometimes been described um, by at least one insurer in New Zealand um, as uh, extending the Overton window. Um, I am independent. Um, I'm not sure that I'll be necessarily to the taste of all the insurance sector on this call, but um, I am independent. Um, I also provide, um, my firm provides advice to the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Um, so we've been advising the Reserve Bank on their the physical risk component of their climate stress testing for um, a number of years. Um, I'm on a, um, a working group with the New Zealand government with Alain Noy looking at um, drafting legislation to make managed retreat out of these most hazardous locations uh, much more straightforward. Um, and I'm interested in particular in this work in terms of how that protection gap is growing when insurers are pulling out. And I've got one um, insight that I had when reading the paper in preparation for this panel, which is it's critical to understand um, how the rate of change is um, impacting that potential expansion of the protection gap. And looking at the ladder, I came to the conclusion that um, policy responses need to be contingent on that rate of change. So by rate of change, I mean the whether an event, for example, at, at the moment that has a return period of 100 years becomes a return period of 50 years by 2050, which would be a, a slow rate of change or a rate of change where you go from a one in 100 year event to say a te one in 10 year event by 2050. If you've got a faster rate of change, that should be something that is taken into account when considering where on the ladder you're comfortable intervening. What I would suggest is the slower the rate of change, the more comfortable you can be in going lower in the ladder without increasing the long-term risk to life. But I'm happy to talk a bit more about that um, if there's some follow-up questions later. Thank you very much, Belinda. And um, I think you raised two sort of very important things. One is this idea of insurer retreat, um, which of course, uh, worsens the gap and as, as I said in my introductory remarks here maybe prudentially sensible from the individual from the perspective of an individual undertaking but um, can have certainly have wider consequences and of course the rate of change you know, how quickly this is all happening um, is is going to be one determinant of the of the policy response so thank you panelists for the um, for, for some introductory remarks let me Ask, ask some questions. And Larissa, let me please turn to you. Um, particularly given, um, given Jerome's um, view that the protection gap is increasing sort of five to seven percent a year. Um, from the Commission's perspective, what would you say is the degree of urgency in addressing the protection gaps? And can you tell us anything about what the Commission is, is doing? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, climate change is a real phenomenon, and uh, the climate protection gap, gap is equally a reality. And um, the dashboard that IOPA has produced is evident in that, and Jerome has mentioned it's data, science um, uh, tell us that the frequency and severity of events is being exacerbated by climate change, uh, losses are growing, the gap is widening. So this is really putting under renewed stress the resilience capacity of our society. And it's clear that action needs to be taken. So it is a priority absolutely for us to identify the measures that may contribute to improving the society's resilience in the face of climate change. And the climate protection gap is on our agenda for some time. And it's actually discussions are intensifying a lot lately. And the idea is really to reach a common understanding of what the climate protection gap entails is and find appropriate solutions. So um, 
the Commission is actually acting on it for uh, some time already, but before telling you exactly what we are currently doing about it, let me just go back a bit and remind the wider political context and um, especially the Commission's strong commitment to address challenges of climate change as reflected in the European Green Deal, that's a commission that the strategy that our Commission has put in place immediately after taking office. Um, it, it also demonstrates our um, strong commitment to the implementation of the Paris Agreement, which uh, allow me to remind you calls um, for making finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low green gas emissions and climate resilience development. So it has both the mitigation and uh, the adaptation side highlighted. As regards climate change adaptation, the Commission has um, proposed uh, quite ambitious climate targets in uh, for 2030 namely reducing greenhouse emissions, so gas emissions to at least 50% below the levels uh, registered in 1990. To achieve this, those targets, the Commission has proposed a package of sectoral policies, a so-called uh, Fit for 55 package. And this is also company, accompanied on the financial sector side with a strategy for financing the transition to, sustainable, uh, to a sustainable economy that I already mentioned in, in my introduction and which is managed uh, in, in DigiFISMA. But the Commission is also very attentive to the need for climate resilience. And insurance is one tool for the management of climate risks. And um, it is already since 2020 that the Commission has uh, extensively actually discussed uh, within the different departments and with outside uh, experts and stakeholders the uh, climate protection gap. And um, these um, discussions have informed the climate adaptation strategy that was adopted early 2021. And at the time, we also published a staff working uh, document that summarized the thinking that it was at the time. I have to say that already in 2020, the insurance industry has uh, shown a great interest in, in, in our work. And has, um, this has increased since and accompanied us in our um, subsequent work. What we found is that um, in, in 2020, 2021, is that the understanding of the climate protection gap was not uh, yet well developed enough. Mm. And uh, to overcome this and gather more information at the time, we uh, the adaptation strategy has um, expressed strong support actually for IOPA's work on the insurance uh, protection gap for natural catastrophes. And uh, it was great, really great to see the dashboard being completed by EOPA at the end of uh, last year. The dashboard um, uh, put, uh, put up by EOPA can definitely contribute to a better understanding of insurance protection gaps. And it is really becoming the reference point as regards the situation in, in the EU. But the dashboard also shows that there's that the climate protection gap is large with only one quarter. It was already mentioned of total losses caused by extreme weather and climate related events across Europe being covered by insurance since the 1980s. So we know that the discussion on how to deal with the protection gap has to continue. And we have um, reached out to many stakeholders. And we have heard from some insurance for in insurers, for instance, that the public policy across the board could provide a better environment for, uh, for the supply of insurance coverage. We have heard from some asset owners that there is lack of understanding on the drivers of insurance premiums. We have heard from consumer associations that there is room for raising awareness on policyholders' exposures to climate risk. And we also listened to researchers and public authorities who highlighted that many problems could be solved if data that insurance car insurers currently hold would be used by other parties as well. So a lot of stakeholders, a lot of perspectives, a lot of issues that, that were raised. And given the, the range of these um, stakeholders affected and the complexity of issues that came to us, we saw that the best way forward uh, would be to get the relevant stakeholders together and facilitate an interdisciplinary discussions on, on ways to tackle the climate protection gap. And that's why in our both in our sustainable finance strategy and adaptation strategy, we actually called for 
uh, setting up the climate resilience dialogue and I'm happy to say that this is now a reality. It has been launched at the end of uh, last year and it's actually fully functioning meetings three times um, every three weeks mm. since, since January. It is a platform for the exchange of uh, on good practices and on solutions to best address the climate protection gaps. Um, it brings together 17 organizations that are uh, quite representative of different stakeholders and actors, including insurers, uh, reinsurers, risk managers, public uh, authorities and regions, representatives of consumers, but also of uh, the real economy. And uh, the dialogue uh, will, uh, will work through the various aspects of related climate protection gaps until the summer of 2024. It will produce a report that will um, include recommendations and best practices. Um, it will publish also an interim report in the summer of 2023 that uh, will include the summary of the understanding so far and an outlook for further work. And it's only in the second phase that it will look at the solutions and best uh, practices and the final report is likely to be published in the second, second quarter of 2024. So we are very much looking forward to see how this Dialogue will examine uh, the role and value proposition of insurance in further building resilience. It is, um, it is currently considering how the insurance industry can better contribute to adaptation, especially through underwriting and investment practices. So that is one of, of um, the main tool that we think might help narrow the climate uh, protection gap. Um, on our side, we are accompanying basically the dialogue and we really approach it with an open mind without any preconceived notions. So uh, we hope this will be developed and result in a much needed collaboration and partnership between the representatives of the private and the public sectors. And I'm sure that also today's papers, the ideas discussed in it will, will con constitute uh, a very good input to, to our future work on this. Thank you very much, Louisa. Um, and yeah, an impressive list of list of activities by the Commission, and you know, in its own way, it reflects actually what has happened in EOPA, the, the shooting up the agenda so quickly of sustainable finance issues in the last in the last few years, with a, a whole plethora of of, of different initiatives. Um, thank you for the kind words about our dashboard. I mean, one of the things that shows is the extent of the diversity between EU member states in terms of protection gaps, um, including by particular perils. And I think that is, um, yeah, th that shows that we are, we are sort of dealing with a, a multifaceted problem. Um, Shigeru, please, let me, let me turn to you. I just want to ask you, is there anything more you wanted to say about um, international work on the protection gap? Maybe just um, anything to add to what you said in your, in your, in your first round, please. You're muted, Shiguru. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Let me mention a bit about what we do in the IAS front. And as I mentioned, uh, we are currently working on a report at the Protection Gap Task Force. And as Justin, you mentioned at the beginning about the difference of supervisory mandate. And I think that was one of the first issues that uh, we had to kind of discuss in find a way to deal with. Because as you may know, uh, for, for some jurisdictions, they only have financial stability mandate. Um, so it's, it, it could be a challenge for these authorities to think about um, financial literacy or insurance market development. For, so, so, so they would argue that our scope is narrow, so we want to confine the discussions as what, what we do in terms of financial stability. But for others, for example, for the Japan FSA, we have a more broad mandate uh, to, to provide you know, smooth funding for, to, to, uh, to promote our national economy and so forth. So obviously the social uh, aspect uh, is within our lens. So we had to have find some kind of a solution to this. And what we are currently working on is to try to map out, regardless of the mandate, to see what, what kind of issues we need to look at uh, in the beginning and what sort of 
uh, use cases or cases uh, could be uh, could be uh, collected from uh, member jurisdictions and see whether that uh, other jurisdictions uh, can learn from what is being done already in uh, other jurisdictions. So that is the kind of approach we want to, we, we're, we're not confining it to a, a single kind of mandate in our discussions right now. Another point that uh, might be useful is uh, we, 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 we were kind of uh, trying to get a feel of what the priorities would be uh, for, for the member countries. And we saw a, a, a sort of a difference uh, between advanced economies and developing economies. Uh, for example, uh, developing economies would uh, emphasize, would, would generally emphasize the importance of uh, financial inclusion or, uh, or trying to, um, or insurance uh, product development. Because uh, for them, it's 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 not about uh, buying insurance. When the catastrophe occurs, they would uh, either rely on their family or their relatives, or they would rely on the government. So it's not it's not customary for them to pro, uh, to purchase insurance to protect themselves. So that's one of the things that uh, is quite different, perhaps uh, looking from a European perspective on what, what we should think about uh, public and private partnerships. So for developing economies, actually financial inclusion could be more important than a sort of a public-private partnership. So you have to kind of put, put that into perspective when you think about reaching out. And at the IS, we have a broad membership so we need to look into that aspect uh, also, not, not only the difference of uh, mandates, but also the difference in priorities uh, among uh, member uh, jurisdictions. So we're, we're looking very carefully on, on that uh, aspect. Another thing that uh, I think uh, several speakers have mentioned already is about uh, the importance about uh, climate uh, adaptation. The implication for adaptation and mitigation is also a very important. Uh, point, but here I, I think uh, many I think would argue that a risk-based premium would be very uh, helpful in that regard, and I do agree with that. But also, if you look from a financial inclusion exclusion perspective, if you have a very kind of uh, differentiated premium, that could mean a de facto prohibited prohibit mm -hmm. prohibition of, uh, ins of providing insurance, which in turn would uh, lead to uh, financial exclusion. So here there's a, I, I'm not really sure if, you, if I should call it a trade-off, but here you need to look at those dimensions. Uh, and uh, I think that could also have an impact of public on P when you think about PPPs, because mm -hmm. when you think about PPPs, there's a general perception from the public sector that, well, it's okay to differentiate, but you need to. We need to ensure that uh, even if there's public money involved, that there. Oh. Shigeru, Shigeru, so we've lost you. Shigeru. Sh so Shigeru, I don't mean to be rude. We can't. We we we, we cannot hear you. Did you lose uh, me for uh, a moment? We, we, we <laughs> lost. Yeah, no, you're back now. <laughs> so anyway, so what I wanted to emphasize here that there are challenges between priorities that yeah. you need to kind of be mindful uh, when you think about uh, narrowing down uh, the protection gap. And one last thing I wanted to mention is I think uh, from our IAIS perspective, it's not just about uh, IEIS. We need to collaborate, as mentioned in the communique, with the OECD, the IDF, the World Bank, and mm -hmm. other stakeholders in, in order to have a clear view on what, uh, what, what the state of play is in terms of the global insurance uh, sector uh, in, in trying to uh, address uh, the protection gap. So let me stop here. Thanks. No, thank you, Shigeru, and I, I was sorry to make gestures at you, but um, though we, we in, in the room here, we couldn't hear you for about uh, for about a minute. But um, no, thank, I, I, th I think we got the um, 
the, the main messages. And certainly, I mean, the point you make about mandates is relevant, the mandates of different supervisors. I mean, EOPA's mandate was amended um, by legislation to include sort of reference to sustainable finance. I think also the point about financial inclusion, others have already mentioned it, and you know, this kind of question of um, what is the demand, what is the kind of potential demand for um, for catastrophe insurance um, yeah, is, is, is relevant here. Jerome, actually, Shigeru's remarks about um, risk-based pricing, um, need for adaptation, uh, I think lead into a, a question I'd like to ask you. And I'd also like to invite the other panelists if they have something they would like to react to in, 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 in this next question, then please, once Jerome has spoken, uh, feel free to intervene. And I wanted to talk about um, catastrophe insurance policies and how can they be designed to ensure that they encourage adaptation and reduce vulnerability to climate-related catastrophes over time. Please, over to you, Joel. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Justin. I would like to make four points. <laughs> Point number one, uh, there's no question about it. I mean, also governments, right? Governments and the local authorities, they have a key role uh, to play in taking a longer term uh, view mm -hmm. on natural catastrophic risk and uh, having more data out there, having more marketing intentions, having more role models and how policies uh, could look like, including TPP, would go a long way. Uh, but it's also about, as mentioned, my initial remarks about more consistent regulation of climate risk and increasing resilience, also through land use, building practices, adaptation, and general risk reduction, which is mm -hmm. adaptation, a team that, that many of my panelists uh, members have also mentioned. That's point one. Point two, yes, no question about it. Uh, um, insurance and uh, insurance players uh, through Catbond or ILS, uh, they can do a lot. They have been doing a lot. They have been doing a lot. If you just look at numbers, the last three decades, fact is actually that the insurance industry has absorbed Inflation adjusted, inflation adjusted loss burden um, that increased by a factor of 10. So it's not inflation that is in that factor of 10, it's inflation adjusted, meaning the insurance industry has done a lot, which doesn't mean we don't need to do more. We need to do more. There's no question about that. And I think, uh, again, coming back to the point about pricing risk, important that pricing risk is uh, not uh, distorted and is well understood. And the way that insurance uh, company or sector would signal that the price of climate risk is through premiums, through deductibles and uh, to, to, to payments. And I think uh, um, even if that risk is, given that the risk is increasing, price uh, of climate risk also increase. And that's maybe the best incentives as well to do more on the climate adaptation while keeping protection gap in check and, and narrowing protection gap. So, so, but definitely insurance can provide and does provide incentives to reduce risk and can do more. Point number three, yes, no question, collaboration between public and private sectors, they need uh, to work on a common stated and understood uh, objective. And um, here, um, I think Justin, you mentioned it. No, actually, Larissa mentioned it from the European Commission. Data exchange is important. It's important for the long term insurability of wildfire, for example, which requires coordination between property owners, insurers, home builders, and, and municipalities. And more data we have, more transparency we have, and more transparency we have, the less distorts out the price signals. That leads me to my last point, point number four. Um, it's mentioned actually in the report, <laughs> in the report, and uh, um, actually um, in um, one month, actually we will have the eight-year anniversary, eight-year anniversary of the, which I think is important in Europe, of the five presidents' report on the capital market union, and uh, that was done on the twenty-second of July of June, twenty. 15 was released and you also mentioned why the EU to quote your report why the EU policy initiatives such as the capital markets union could also help to further develop and integrate EU financial and insurance markets I totally agree and uh, um, again uh, coming back to the capital markets uh, that are necessary to unlock uh, the capital which is around which is looking for return but also needs to be guided um, I think there goes a long way to do more on the capital markets. 
front and in Europe capital markets union for climate risk uh, should be financed, uh, it can be financed, we need to transform our, our capital market, insurance will always play a key role, but let's not forget also the capital markets. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. And um, I, 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 I will ask you a question in a moment, Belinda, I just want to invite any of the other panel, you or any of the other panelists, if there's anything you wanted to to say in relation to to Jerome's four points. Uh, Shiguru, and then and then Belinda. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. I think it was very useful. And just one short comment, but I do agree with uh, the importance about data collection because obviously for for private sector business, that's the key uh, in 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 proper pricing, the appropriate pricing. So I agree, do agree with that. Uh, elevated risk management could go either way. I think that's a very important too. Go either way, you might be t taking the risk that you should not be taking but also you might be not taking the risk that you should be taking. But it could go either way. But I think in any case, I think it would be very important to try to sharpen the risk management uh, for, for I, I think that would be a very important aspect as well. So let me stop here, I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Shigeru. Belinda, please. So just the comment I'd make is that um, the, under, the fundamental underlying cost of insurance is the, um, the probability of the event and the consequence um, of that event. So when um, there is, um, has been perhaps in the near history a lower pricing in cap bonds relative to reinsurance, um, that is as, la as much been driven by uh, worldwide low in, in interest rates and um, attraction of, the, of that asset for those chasing yield. So um, there needs to be a little bit of a caution, assuming that cat bonds can provide the premium at any lower price than a reinsurer could. No, yes, indeed. Thank you. And that, that I think, is a point also made in the paper, that um, the cat bond market is, is potentially susceptible to, to changes in interest rates. Uh, what, what, while we have you, Belinda, let me, let me ask you a question. And again, I will invite the other panellists, as they wish, to also to, um, to intervene. Um, and building on what Jerome said about pricing risk, um, to what extent do you think that current, uh, current insurance models are adequate for incorporating climate change risks? Uh, part of the, the significant difficulty that um, we face in understanding how um, insurance pricing may change in the future is the limitations of the climate models themselves. Yeah. So the climate models are very good at giving you an understanding of what the average climate is going to be in 2050 or 2100. Um, it's particularly difficult for those models to be able to provide indications of how extreme events are going to change. Um, if I can share one of my fun facts, uh, we have a super supercomputer in New Zealand, which is sits within one of the research institutes that manage um, climate research in New Zealand. It calculates 1,400 trillion calculation, calculations per second. And yet when they put a um, climate model into that that computer, it takes that computer one to three months to come up with an answer. So that is just how sophisticated these climate models are. What that means is the climate um, physicists can run those models three or four times a year on those supercomputers, which makes it extremely difficult for them to be able to get an understanding about how the tail is changing. So while um, we have very sophisticated models for understanding about existing risk and how that might be changing incrementally in the next year or two, it is particularly difficult to get an understanding about how the extremes are changing. And yet the work of my colleague Alain Noy has shown that it is in the extremes that have by far the most impact from an economic perspective, um, out of proportion to where they sit in, in the um, distribution. So um, I think that there is um, a much greater need for uh, demands to be placed from the financial sector into the, into the science community to ask them to consider how better to model those extremes within timeframes that are relevant to financial decision makers, not 2100, but within the next two or three decades. 
Um, the other key piece is that insurers and reinsurers only really need to think out one year to three years on the basis of their, their contracts. So while the TCFD, for example, has been pushing the many sectors to be thinking longer and insurers are starting to do that, there's no direct financial requirement on insurers to do sophisticated modelling beyond the length of their reinsurance contracts, which are about three years. Yes, no, thank you. That's uh, that, that, that's an interesting point. Um, and actually, what, what, while we have been building on what you were saying about the models, um, what are the what would you say are the data needs to incorporate forward-looking considerations um, to it, it, or for actuarial or valuation models? So I, I fully support um, the call for open source. Um, mm -hmm. What I would um, indicate is that it's not a simple task. Climate scientists have been building their models to share their data with other climate scientists. They are not building those um, model outputs to be answering financial questions. Um, and so getting a level of standardization into the research community is a, a key challenge, but I absolutely support um, it being undertaken. Um, I think there needs to be much more of direct communication between the science community and the financial sector in order to be able to help them understand exactly what sort of outputs are going to be needed. A really simple example, um, the ones I've talked about, is that uh, climate scientists love to talk about 2100. Very few financial models are going to run out to 2100. Um, and again, um, most of those models are designed for the mean, not for the extreme. Um, I think any policy intervention into the insurance market to try and close the insurance gap needs uh, whatever form of effective subsidy that um, involves, whether it's a backstop direct intervention, such as vouchers or a public scheme, must come with a requirement to share modelling um, with the regulators. Um, I'm not suggesting so much the modelling in terms of the hazard themselves, because as I mentioned earlier, the insurers don't really have modelling out to you know a decade or two. But what in, um, insurers do have the best understanding of is exposure and vulnerability. So if there is government intervention to try and close this gap, it needs to come with a expectation on uh, the insurance sector to provide information. We're moving from a, a, a situation where there is, over the last three or so decades, we've had an expectation that this argument that it's commercially sensitive is enough to be able to pre prevent sharing of information with regulators. I think regulators need to be asking for more, particularly if there's a, a significant issue that we recognise has a major impact on the economy and the state is being asked to step in to help mm. close that gap. But I imagine that my panellists will have different views on this. Well, uh, Belinda, you're doing my job for me. Um, this is uh, maybe where I, I, I happily invite the other panellists to to reflect on, um, well, reflect on all that you've said in terms of things like models, um, risking looking at too much of averages rather than extremes, um, your support for open source data um, and you know, the, the models should be shared with the regulator. I mean, these are all interesting ideas. I'd be, again, interested if uh, any anyone from the panel would like to like to respond. Yeah, I would love to respond. Please, to yeah. speaking. Uh, a number of topics have been mentioned, right? Uh, first of all, um, Let's be clear about what is driving the economic losses. It's not just the extreme events. It's actually increasingly, and that's based on our Sigma uh, data, it's actually increasingly what we call in the industry, and uh, 33 has coined that term, a secondary perils, which are higher frequency, lower severity events, uh, not, not just the big earthquakes, but floods and, and wildfires and, and the like. So that, 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 that's point one, just to be clear that uh, uh, secondary perils are as important, if not even becoming more important than, than primary uh, perils. And point number two, in terms of the models, yes, absolutely, there's no question about that, that there will always inherently be limitation about uh, uh, models. I, I would say, however, uh, that the industry 
Um, and uh, that's also testimony on the, on the numbers I just provided earlier. If you think about that for a second, the last three decades, industry has absorbed an inflation adjusted loss burden that had increased by a factor of 10. That wouldn't have been possible if you wouldn't have had improved models. That wouldn't have been possible if you wouldn't have had the capital to put at, 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 at risk and having your own risk and management uh, uh, techniques uh, so, so surrounding it. And I think over the last few years, the industry has also developed much more and needed to do more forward looking rather than, uh, than, than, than backward looking. And point number three, in modeling economic losses, it's one thing to take it from a climate uh, or catastrophe um, parallel perspective in, in, in estimating the distribution of events and severity, it's as important actually to take uh, the economic development urbanization into account. And uh, we have been seeing that uh, last year and the year uh, before and, and now with the surge in inflation. Um, which is increasing the climate and protection gaps. Modeling, and, but that's not just new because of inflation surge, but modeling climate also you need to model the economy. So we need, <laughs> that's why in, 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 in bigger uh, companies you, you see concerted efforts in terms of uh, modeling. And then when I mentioned in data, yes, I think there is a, there is a case uh, for, for sharing more data, but I think it goes, uh, the data goes not just one way, it goes both ways, because at the end of the day, um, we are living in an open market in, in environment and the open market environment works if you have more data and if you have more uh, transparency for the pricing uh, of, uh, of risks. So I will leave it at you. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Um, let me just um, turn to ECB colleagues. Are there any questions in the chat or on the... Um, um, any questions being raised? On, by, by the audience. We do have some questions from the chat. Yes. So one is from Charles Lowe from Firma. Uh, for Belinda, but also whoever wants to intervene. So thanks a lot for raising the point about insurance uh, retreat. Is there anything innovative going on in New Zealand or Australia to lure insurers back into the space? Or is it something that now the government uh, is, is facing and therefore taxpayers? Thank you. Please, Belinda. Uh, so there's significant discussion um, being undertaken um, uh, at the um, government level about potentially providing support in the markets, particularly for flooding. So we have um, the insurance retreat work that I undertook was, was initially looking at um, the impact of sea level rise, but there have been um, calls by... Um, uh, um, local um, communities and um, politicians for looking at bringing in a public scheme. Um, uh, some of you may be aware that we've had um, a major event in New Zealand, which was one of our few uh, national emergencies, uh, Cyclone Gabriel, which caused devastation across a number of different regions. Um, that is something that the, the country is currently undertaking in a recovery process. And Swiss Re is providing analysis to the New Zealand government in order to be able to take that. So thank you for your contribution on that. Um, at this stage, um, there are significant discussions being undertaken about what that intervention might be. Thank you. And maybe just, I don't know if Shigu or Larissa wanted to add anything to sort of innovative policies being considered, um, well, either based on your IAS experience or, or, or in the EU? I wanted to very much like um, share with Belinda as well what she said, because we heard a lot of that in Europe as well in our discussions in the context of um, our preparatory work, the climate resilience dialogue. So um, data sharing amongst the different data owners in different directions is, is crucial basically to improving the models that are going on. And um, you, you were also referring to the idea of standardization. And here, obviously, as a policy maker, uh, I, I immediately the green light went on. But I, I would definitely first like to understand what prevents standardization within the sector, within the model creators right now. Uh, is there a need actually for even public intervention on that? And also for the open model and the sharing um, why isn't it happening within the community of those who own the data? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Louisa. 
Um, Margarita, I got the impression that you said that there was that there was more than one question. Please, um, let's have uh, let's have another have one. Quite an active chat. So, on the topic of reinsurers providing less coverage this year, uh, can the 2022 year can be considered a cyclical reinsurance crisis, or was it a market failure, a structural failure, which means a rethinking of insurance framework? This is from uh, Michel Le Petit. Thank you, Michel. Oh, what a question. Um, Jérôme, can I invite you? Uh, uh, absolutely. Well, first of all, I would see it differently. It's not a market failure. If, uh, and uh, I wouldn't judge a uh, market failure whether price is increasing or price is uh, decreasing. Maybe you have a market failure in not having, um, not having addressed the inflation uh, gap in the first place. Uh, uh, globally, but but anyway, um, in in terms of um, uh, coverage of uh, of of NATCAT, uh, risk, I mean, fact is uh, inflation surge and uh, um, and also the extraordinary year that we had uh, uh, last year on the NATCAT front, it led to an accumulation of risk. It was basically the perfect storm um, for for demanding more NATCAT uh, coverage, and that as as such, after a while of extremely low prices soft prices on NATCAT front, uh, we need to see uh, prices on NATCAT uh, uh, front increasing. And that is what has happening, uh, what has been happening now for a year or two. I would predict uh, that that environment will continue for a while. Um, a number of reasons. One is the inflation. Uh, inflation will come down. However, low inflation still means higher prices. And that also needs to be compensated. And second, yes, yeah, sure, we had also seen, and it was uh, commented on, we had seen um, the frequency and severity of events uh, uh, going in in uh, in a direction uh, which uh, almost every year we, we see new record uh, uh, events and uh, um, it goes without saying that if you have a uh, on average five to seven percent increase in economic losses from that cut event uh, that the direction especially with, within the current uh, macro environment it, it means continued uh, higher price and then maybe last point but not least and this is often forgotten um the fact that the risk-free rate has adjusted needs to be welcomed for for all uh, financial market pricing and also for society but what it meant for insurance company is also that the shareholders uh, uh, capital and equity uh, came under pressure. Uh, higher in, uh, interest rates means uh, lower shareholder equity and capital, um, and meaning uh, last year, but also this year, you have more demand for a number of reasons for NATCAT coverage, meeting um, less traditional uh, capital available. And I don't see yet uh, the non-traditional ILS market returning to the same extent like the past. ILS market complementary, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but yes, it's also yield. Um, often the investor is motivated not just by diversification of financial market risk, but also increase in, in yields. And we all know that with the rise in risk-free rates, uh, we also have uh, more alternatives for invest, which should be also be welcome. So that's why short message, um, it's not a reinsurance crisis at all. Quite the contrary, it's a reinsurance repricing, which is healthy and needed. And I would expect the hard market to continue. I stop here. Thank you. No, thank you, Jerome. And the cyclicality of the reinsurance market is certainly something that is uh, that that is mentioned in the, in in the paper. I reckon we've got time for one more, maybe, uh, Margarita, please. Yes. So there is another question from Anna Madlener, founder in residence at Marble. So we talk a lot about cap models and data sources, which at the moment do not appear to be sufficient. So she's asking how important is data collection for pricing the risk? And can you provide concrete examples of data and models on which your institutions are also working? Thank you. And can I start with you, Belinda? Um, so, uh... To, yes, there's um, data is a significant issue. It yeah. does depend um, in large part on what the um, the regulatory arrangement that you have within particular countries. As an example, climate and weather data is less available in New Zealand than it is um, in Australia or the um, the UK. Um, and it's less of all of those are less available than they are in the US. So surprisingly, the US actually has the most accessible mm -hmm. data. And that is because the funding of research requires that the information is made available 
at a particular time frame um, and it's required to be open source. If the, in the absence of the requirement as a condition of funding of the research, it be, ends up being that the research output is completed, but it then has ad hoc mechanisms for sharing that data. Thank you, Belinda. Anyone else, any, anyone else on the panel like to reflect on the importance of data? It looks like I can't tempt you, and we have already discussed this um, discussed this at length. So, um, look, I think we're 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 coming towards the end. Um, I mean, I won't possibly try to sum up everything that was that was said, but um, I think it's been a very good discussion with some participants, literally from all over the world. Um, I would say that yeah, the, there was certainly a welcome from all quarters to the uh, ECB EOPA paper. Um, you know, the, the, the insurance protection gap is a very timely and relevant issue and you know, this contribution is, 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 is very valued. That there is an agreement that action is certainly needed. I mean, uh, Jerome's point that the, um, that the gap is potentially increasing at between five to 7% a year. So it's great that we identify it. It's great that we identify policy options for dealing with it, but you know, the problem is, uh, it, it is building. This is clearly already recognized at, at a high level. And Shiguru, I think mentioned the G7 um, communique and uh, Larissa spoke you know, at, uh, about all the EU initiatives that are taking place on the on the protection gap and related activities, um, one part of that was in relation to the role of supervisors and their mandates. And again, uh, Larissa spoke of that as um, did Shiguru. And you know, importantly, that different supervisors around the world will have different emphases, um, including on financial inclusion in um, in in some developing markets. We had a very good discussion of models and data. I thought um, Belinda's point that, um, yes, you can model this stuff, but it takes New Zealand's biggest supercomputer one to three months to, um, to, to do so, um, is relevant as a kind of practical, practical constraint. Um, that the models may have a tendency to consider sort of averages rather than extremes. And of course, particularly in the world of insurers as risk managers, it is often the extremes uh, which, we're, which we're interested in. But the way Jerome made the counterpoint that um, actually sort of there is a lot of insurance activity in relation to the um, in relation to the average, that it is not just the extreme events, but the sort of the first rung on the ladder that is set out in the paper that is also increasing in activity um, and you know there was I think agreement on the crucial role of data and an interesting discussion on um, open source and you know, some some illustrations from jurisdictions around the world of the extent of that look I know I haven't covered everything but you know I thought this was a a very rich discussion and I really thank um both thank the audience for their questions and for their attention and of course thank my thank my panelists for for their contributions. Thank you very much.